Sabbath, Mosaic? I am very happy to be here today. And did you know that today is Global Youth Day? Yes, if you're feeling young, give me a thumbs up. All right. So it doesn't matter your age. Today is Global Youth Day. So if you feel like being young, be young today. And I'm just so happy to be here. I want to share my favorite uh, Bible verse that talks about the youth. And that's actually what we put in behind our shirts here in our mosaic t-shirts. It says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So saying those words, I invite you to have that kind of heart today to worship the Lord because he has been amazing and done wonderful things, not only with the young people, but with everyone here in this church. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all of your blessings and thank you because we get to worship your name. You are amazing, Lord, and we ask you to please be with us as we enjoy this wonderful wonderful Sabbath together. Help us um, have a great program so that we get out of this church joyful, sharing the good news with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. And don't worry, I'm not forgetting our online viewers. I hope you're following along with us. (laughs) Fun fact. Actually, you guys took my chance to say this, but I will say it again. Today is Global Youth Day. So, <laughs> so all my fellow youth will be helping to put together the service for today. So we hope you enjoy the service today. Now on to our announcements. First off, our last Let's Move Day was two years ago. I would like to invite up Ms. Sue Monroe so she can elaborate more and go into depth for us. Good morning. I hope you have, if you had a, chur- a shirt from two years ago, you found it and you can wear it and come tomorrow. We're going to be at Town Lake Park at 8.30. You will see us because we'll probably be the only group there, hopefully, um, to begin with. Um, but we're going to be doing some of the things that I mentioned last week. And you see up here, kite flying. Um, You can bring a kite, any kite, and just fly it. There'll be a certain time when everybody will get to fly their kites together. Um, And we've got a big open area in a parking lot. But if you made a kite, bring it, and you will actually, um, your kite will be judged and your uh, ability to fly it, how high you can get it. So it's a little bit uh, expanded from what we've done last year. Um, We're also going to do the runs. You need to get there and be in line at 9 o'clock. And we're going to have volleyball and some other events. And I ask Isaac to come up here because he has uh, been helping get uh, the volleyball and the other events together. So Isaac. So um, for the races, so who really wants to run a race at 9 a.m.? So there's a couple people here. So I know I wouldn't want to, so I brought some motivation. If you win the one-mile race, you get a $25 gift card, only for first place. For the 5K, you get a $40 Chipotle card. So the top three get medals, so if you really, if you want to get, that's some motivation that you can use, sign up, and um, we'll have that. Also for the games, we're going to have egg races, we're going to have a CrossFit Games, and then we're going to have uh, Simon Says. So we have, we can really play all types of games that we want to play because of COVID. So that's what we adjusted to. So they're going to be really fun. And all ages are invited from adults to children. So everybody, please come out tomorrow. Thank you. We're also going to have a volleyball game. So we'll have teams that we'll divide up based on the uh, people that have registered. Um, but if you know people that didn't get to come today and register, they can still come. But ask them to get there by 8.30 <clears throat> so that we can get them, in, if, especially if they want to play volleyball. Um, this is free. doesn't cost a thing. Um, there will be snacks. We'll have water for everybody. Um, some of the ministries here at our church have helped with getting the things that we need like that, the snacks and the water. So I uh, say thank you to those uh, 
of the in the ministries that have. Please bring your mask, um, particularly if we're running with, there, there'll be other people on the trail or on the sidewalk. So if you come up to a group, just put your mask up, just out of courtesy, especially if they are wearing their masks. So, um, and because we still are social distancing, even if we're outside. So I hope to see all of you, and let's have a great time with our friends from Mosaic. God has given us this time. He's given us good health and bodies that um, can run and have fun. So thank you. Thank you. Also, a little extra thing on Let's Move Day. Um, it does start at 9, but from 8.30 to 9, if you want to participate in the 5K or the one mile run, they will have a warm up for the people participating from 8.30 to 9. So, little refresher. When is Let's Move Day? Okay. Do you need to register for some events? Okay. If you would like to register, there's a table outside with all the sign up sheets. Now, we have a small group called the Children's Choir. So there is no, you must be a child, of course. I mean, we're not gonna judge you if you come here and you're an adult, but no discrimination. Um, it will be led by Miss Alicia Olson. It will be, sorry, hosted by Miss Alicia Olson. The leader will be Miss Lily. I am sorry, I forgot your last name. But, and also the assistant leader will be yours truly. <laughs> You can contact her at children at mosaic dot at mosaic sda dot org. I'm sorry, I cannot speak today. <laughs> also, we will have our spring care group starting now. They will be every week for ten weeks. They will be starting on March twenty eighth and ending on May thirtieth. Also, for our online viewers, or if you're here today, if you would like to wait, you will see the spring care groups listed throughout the service today. Or you can go back to the beginning where they're all listed out. You, if you would like to sign up, go to mosaicsda.org slash groups. Now, of course, because it's Youth Sabbath, we're going to have an AY Vespers after church. It'll be at 6.17 p.m., which is going to be a new time, and it'll be here in the sanctuary. All ages are welcome, and... You, you can be an adult, you can be a grandma, a grandpa, aunt, great aunt, doesn't matter. As long as you feel youthful, or we can help you feel youthful if you don't feel youthful. So feel free to come over. Amen. Thank you, church, and happy Sabbath. We, we, we missed the Global Youth Day activities for today. Can I just say those real quick? Okay, I think that's important because that's happening today. Um, can we go to this life for Global Youth Day? just so people know what's going on real quick. Um, so today, after service, there will be time for you to go for lunch and then come back at 2.30. We have a community outreach event open to everyone. We'll have free COVID testing. We'll have uh, free food and free prayer. And all will be in a drive through format. So people will be driving around the church for that. And all of you are invited for that. And then, of course, AY Vespers. And then after AY Vespers, we have socials for everyone. So come play with us tonight. Thank you. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs with love for me. And I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily live my hands. For I will always sing of love you looking down. I could sing of your love forever. To be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when you're looking down. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love.
Here I am to worship, here I am to bow 
some things here for you guys. I try not to break anything. I got to set up some stuff here. But I got a question for you guys. What if I was to give you some water and that water was to never run out? Ever. What would you do with that water? Drink it. What else? Anything else? Huh? Save it. Share it. Give it to people. Anything else? Water plants. Swim in it, maybe. Might as well, right? It's not going anywhere. Got it. All right. So Jesus tells us that he 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 can give us living water. So today we have a few things. This is going to represent Jesus for me. So the water is going to represent Jesus, never ending water. This is going to represent us. Anybody notice anything about this? Huh? It's empty, right? Jesus asks us to empty ourselves daily. You know why he asks us to empty ourselves? Huh? You said it. What did you say? He wants to be able to fill us. Can you put something, put water into something that's already full? No? I'm going to put on my nice electric blue gloves here. They're nice, and, they're nice and fancy blue gloves. Yeah, they're fancy. If I put them on the right hand, it would help. <laughs> All right. And I have one other item that I'm going to show you guys. So, Jesus wants us to empty ourselves daily. We have a scripture here. Uh, our scripture is found in John 4, verse 14. You guys see this? Let me take this out of here for a minute. 
Sip. But whosoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is willing to give us never-ending water. He calls himself never-ending water. So, sometimes in life we're faced with sin. This is going to represent sin for us. Sometimes we let sin into our lives. But if we have Jesus in us, what, is, what happens? What's happening to the dries? It's evaporating, right? But what is this? So you can see Jesus working in our lives to get rid of that sin, to work that sin out of us, right? To help us deal with that sin in many different ways. We see a product, this product, this smoke. We're going to call this hope. Jesus gives us hope. What's happening to this hope? What's it doing? It's falling out, right? When there are other people around us, what happens to the hope? They get some of it, right? All right. So sometimes we get in our own way or we get in Jesus' way. He's doing the work in our life. And instead of us sharing what God has done for us, we are nervous, afraid, or ashamed sometimes for some reason or another. What do you think happens when we try to keep what God has done for us to ourselves? Instead of sharing our hope, we try to keep it to ourselves. Let's see if I can do this without messing it up. This thing's rocking. Where's the hope? It's stuck inside, right? But the Holy Spirit comes along, and if we keep walking with Jesus and keep listening, the Holy Spirit comes along, and I won't book. <laughs> Can you poke it? There you go. And what happened to the hope? It's spilled out, right? Overwhelming hope, spilled out. So what's the lesson here? Keep God in your hearts. What else? Don't let sin take over you. As long as you got God in your heart, he'll help you deal with that. He'll give you strength. Most of us already, we are familiar with the details of the story. Goliath, a Philistine champion, a giant standing nine feet tall. Can you imagine that this morning? He was a professional soldier. He was well armed and he was well equipped for battle. And he was leading his army, the Philistines against the armies of Israel, the people of God. So just picture that in your mind. Nine feet tall. People who are seven feet are considered giants for us today. We have some people like that in the NBA. But Goliath is nine feet tall. I believe that the top of the basketball rim is, up. I think it's 10 feet to the top of the rim. Can you imagine that Goliath didn't have to do anything to dunk? Goliath could just walk by and take the ball and without even having to jump, just boom, just drop the ball down in there. That's how tall and big Goliath was. Now, King Saul, we know King Saul and the armies of Israel, they were terrified and paralyzed by fear. From the way things looked, Goliath was going to do some damage that day in the valley. He's leading his people now to fight against uh, the armies of Israel. From the way things look after Goliath issued his challenge, there was no one that was going to come from Israel who would be his equal and who would challenge his ability. Nobody from Israel was going to challenge his ability. The army of Israel providing someone who was willing to go and fight with Goliath, it seemed like this was an impossible task 
to find anybody to volunteer. Yeah. If Goliath, you know, when I think about it, Goliath really was a bully. This was a fight that Israel felt like if we send anybody out there to do battle with him, this is one battle that we cannot win. And in this battle that day in the valley, the stakes were very, very high. The stakes were high. You know, it's one thing, brothers and sisters, um, when you have to go into battle and the stakes aren't high. But this day, the stakes were high. Have you ever been challenged by someone to fight? It was somebody bigger than you, somebody stronger than you, somebody that you knew that if you went up against them, you had no chance of winning. This was Israel's dilemma that day. If Goliath wins the contest, this is what he says on the battlefield. He says, Israel, you are going to be our slaves. That's why you just kind of see Goliath. He just was a bully. He had everything working on his size, on, on his side, rather size, strength, and everything. So he's saying, if I win this day, all of you all are going to be our slaves. If you win, then we will be your slaves. So we can see that the stakes were high. There was this was a lot on the shoulders of of one man. This one man that would take on Goliath, he would be representing his entire nation. The stakes were high, and that's a lot of pressure to put on one person. Talking about pressure, have you ever been in a situation where you felt a lot of pressure? You know, when we would play a sport sometimes, we would come down to that decisive moment, or even like somebody on the basketball court, and you got to take the last shot. And you know, some people don't even want the ball. There's some people, uh, when they're playing, you get to that part where the stakes are high. You know, there's some players in the NBA, when you have to take the last shot, if it's not a Kobe, if it was not a Michael Jordan, or one of these outstanding players, there's some people, they don't want the ball. They don't want to take the last shot because they can feel the pressure. So at times when I used to play sports, we would say to other people, the pressure is killing you. You can't handle the pressure. So that's what was happening here. That was a lot of pressure. So here we have it. Goliath on the battlefield, calling out for a challenger from Israel. Everybody in Israel is scared. And the challenge was issued. You all are going to be slaves, or we all are going to be slaves. Take on this giant man of war. You know, you read in the story, the Bible tells you all about his spear, and he had somebody holding a shield in front of him. He was well armed, and he was well protected. And all of this terror is on the field. Now, that sets the background for the story for where we're going to go. So now, into this, picture this now, into this serious conflict. Where there's pressure into this situation when the stakes are high, when so much is at stake. Hey, when we read our story here, this is when David appears on the scene and he spoke the words that are recorded in verse 32. So look at that now. So the pressure is on. The stakes are high. There's a lot of fear in the hearts of men. And into this situation comes this young man. He's but a youth. David walks and he comes on the scene. And he speaks these words in verse 32. Let's see what he said in, this, in these words. And this forms the entire basis for what I will share with you this morning. In verse 32. And David now, he walks into this volatile situation. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him, that giant. Boy, that's some big talk right there. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Can you imagine that? You had soldiers, you had veteran men of war were on that field, probably trying to hide behind one another when Goliath will call. And then here comes David. He walks right into the scene. And these bold words, let no man's heart, he's trying to encourage them, fail because of him, 
thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Everyone else, the king and all of the experienced, battle-tested and veteran soldiers, they were trembling in fear. But David, a youth, now watch it now, he's not even a soldier. He is a keeper of sheep. He's not trained in military warfare. He's not equipped with the weapons of this war-monging Goliath. And he stands boldly, unafraid. And he answered the, he answered the challenge of Goliath. Oh, this morning, brothers and sisters, I declare to you, that is courage. Some may ask, well, you know, sometimes when people see young people stand up and they're determined to do great things, you know, sometimes people will watch you with one eye. And there were some people there, when they heard the, ver- the words of David, they may have asked and said, well, after David showed up, you know, uh, 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 they, 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 they were wondering, before he spoke these words, does he really understand all that is on, at stake and on the line? Well, maybe this young fella didn't see the giant. Maybe he didn't hear the giant. Does he really understand what's at stake? Does he understand what's on the line? After all, he's not a soldier. He does not understand warfare. Was this young man just giving idle talk? Was he misguided? Was he immature? Was he fully aware of all of the consequences and the hazards of going out there to meet Goliath? Does he understand that Goliath will show him no mercy? Does he understand that Goliath is not joking and that he is serious about this challenge? Well, verse 23 answers that question for us. Because when you look at verse 23 in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 23 tells us that David for himself, he heard and he saw Goliath. Yet, he was not afraid. Despite the fact that he heard a giant and saw the giant, David still said, I will go. Watch this. David understood the assignment. Make no mistake about it. David was well aware of the mission. He was not misguided. He was thinking clearly. He knew the consequences of going out to face the giant. He knew it would be a fight to the death. Yet, he was still willing to go. I say again this morning, what courage. Young people, I'm here today to tell you that like David on the battlefield in our story, we too have a big, powerful enemy who opposes the people of God. And the stakes are just as high for us today as the stakes were for David when he faced down Goliath. The outcome in this contest today on the battlefield of life. Listen to me. The outcome, young people, on the battlefield of life, it is either eternal life or eternal death. You know, some people don't understand. You know, sometimes I, I, I sit and I wonder and I watch people and I, and, I want, and I look at how careless we can be sometimes with our soul salvation. It is as if we don't realize that The stakes are high. We are talking about eternal life or we are talking about eternal death. Anybody that's here likes living? I like living. Anybody here like living? Yeah. I love life. I appreciate the fact that God created us and gave us an opportunity to share in his existence and his experience. I love life. And I'm looking for the day when I can live life eternally. Not in a place that's like this messed up world, like we have it and we see it and we know it now, 
but I'm talking about living eternally in the paradise of God, where there is eternal youth and vigor, where the Bible says that I will run and not get weary. I will walk and I will not faint. I will be able to explore and enjoy all of the wonders of God's creation. And every day, no day will ever come to an end. It will be like that for an eternity. Brothers and sisters, we ought to be serious. The stakes are high when it comes to our soul salvation. The most pitiful creature that will be destroyed in the end will be somebody who is on the outside of that wall of the city looking in when you should be on the inside looking out. Oh, brothers and sisters, and especially for young people, I want you to know today the stakes are high. And just as David had to face his Goliath there, we today are still facing an enemy. Now, we all know the story. We all know the story. We all know that David... He takes on Goliath, and he defeats him. We know how the story ends. The little guy in this story wins against all odds. No one expected David to be victorious that day. I'm even surprised that David was allowed to get on the battlefield. Nobody expected him to win, but I love this story because in this story, the little guy wins. David defeats Goliath. Well, brothers and sisters, I want you to know something this morning. I'm talking to my young people. This story in the Bible, this is not a fantasy or a fairy tale. The same victory uh, that David experienced way back then, every young person, I want you to listen to me, the same victory that David experienced when he went up against Goliath is not a fantasy, it's not a fairy tale. The same victory that he experienced, you and I can experience that victory today. That victory can be ours if we too are willing to go in God's name. You know, that's what David said in verse 45 when he went to Goliath. He said, you're coming to me with all of those weapons, but you got to understand something. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Now, there are three quick, quick, three <laughs> quick keys to David's success. That's what I want to leave with my young people today. How is it? How is it that the little guy was able to go up against the big guy? And I, and I just want you to I just want you to picture that in your mind. Goliath with all of his armor and all of his weapons and all of his experience standing in the valley calling out at the armies of Israel. And when somebody did come out to challenge him, it was not another big a mighty man of war. But it was just a shepherd boy, a youth, staff in his hand, his little bag on his side, not even a sword attached to his side. He's the one who went out. To what were the keys to David's success? I'm going to give you three quick things, and then I'm going to take my seat. And I promise you, young people, that if you practice these three keys in your life. You will move from victory to victory. And when you look back at, and when you grow older in years and your hair starts to grow dim and your steps become slowed, you will not look back with regrets, but you will look back and say, man, what a life I have lived. What victories God has delivered to me. Because the same thing God did for David, God can do for you. So here are the three quick keys that I'll share with you. Uh, David asked a series of questions throughout this narrative. So young people, when you read this, one of your assignments today, go home and just read 1 Samuel chapter 17 and see how many questions, see how many questions David asked. He asked a series of questions throughout this entire narrative, but we're just going to focus on Two questions for right now, because these two questions gives us the first key to successful when we are going to success when we are going to go for God. These first two, two of these questions, it allows us to get into David's head. 
It allows us to understand what he was thinking that day on the battlefield. So we focus on these two questions. The first question now, the first question is found in the last part of verse 26. David asked the question. He says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Everybody else is running scared. David comes out. David sees the giant. David isn't scared of the giant. David stares down the giant, and he wants to know, who is this pagan? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And then the second question David asked was this. The second question he asked is found in verse 29. Again, it's found there in the last part. And David asked this question. He looked around at the trembling armies. He looked around at Saul that was hiding in his tent. And David stepped out on the battlefield with Goliath boasting and spewing all of his comments. And David declared, is there not a cause? Is there not a cause? Who is this Philistine? Defying, watch what he says now, defying the armies of the living God. Then David wanted to know, is there not a cause? Key number one, young people, practice it. It will bless your life. David's victory against the giant Goliath came about because David had a deep desire to honor God. He had what? Talk to me. Woo. David had a deep desire, young people, to honor God. Like David, this should always be our true motive when we serve God. And when we will say, I will go. We should always have the desire foremost to bring honor and glory to God's name and not self. When you live life for self, you're heading down a bad path. One of the keys to David's secret that David could take on that giant. David, when he walked out on the battlefield, he had a deep burning desire in his heart. And that desire was to honor God and not self. David had a righteous indignation when he served Goliath. David was upset because this pagan Philistine was dishonoring his God and his people. God's, listen, God's name and God's reputation was on the line. And this disturbed David. Are you disturbed when God's name is being, when God's name is dishonored? And I can recall one night this week, I was watching something on the, a, a, a show on the television and then just was a couple lines in the show. You know, they made some remarks to God. And after the person made those remarks to God, I was done with that show. I was like, you know what? You can't, you can't make some remarks like that about religion and about God. I, was, I, I shut it down. I'm done with that. That's how David was. When David stepped out there, David wasn't concerned about himself. David wanted to know, how can we stand by and let this man dishonor God? and dishonor God's name. Like David, our love for God and a desire to honor him should always be the motivation for how we choose to live our lives and the decisions that we make. Young people, I guarantee you today that if you make honoring God a priority, I guarantee you that you will always be blessed. And that you will have success in your life. So this is the first key. David wanted and had a deep desire to honor God. David's relationship and love for God was the key to his success. His actions were not motivate, motivated by a desire for wealth or fame, but for God's glory. You know, we have a lot of people today... Everybody, you know, I sit down sometimes and I watch people, look, look, wanting to just get wealthy and famous. Well, you know what? There are people, I, I read of somebody who died recently in the news. And it says this person leaves behind 
a $24,000 square foot mansion in Palm Beach. This person left behind a $56 million airplane. This person was worth almost $600 million. So what? He's dead. And, go, and guess what? Somebody else is going to fly that plane. Somebody else is going to live in that house. And somebody else is going to spend that money. David was not motivated by wealth or fame. David wanted to honor God. That's key number one. Young people, I'm telling you, I have proven it. And there are adults in here who would agree with me. We guarantee you that if you put honoring God first, that is the key to success. So that's why when David went out there, David wasn't concerned about Goliath. David was concerned about God's honor. Key number two. David, key number two to David's victory was this. And this is simple. Listen, understand what I'm saying. I want to make sure, the way I worded this, I say I hope they get what I'm saying. David showed up. He was present and he was engaged. Now that may sound simple, but you know what? Listen, David would not have fought Goliath if he was not where God could use him. Young people, David showed up. He was present and he was engaged. He couldn't take on Goliath if he was anywhere else other than where God had intended for him. Praise God that you were here today for this service. That you were here in the house of God today. That you showed up. You are present. Many of our young people have left the church, but praise God, you are here. <laughs> this means that you are in a position, listen to me, you are in a position where God can work through you to fulfill his purpose. You know, there's some people God cannot work through. God can't do anything with them or for them. And you know why he can't do it right now? It's because they are not in position. They're not where God would have them to be. So I praise God for all of you young people who showed up, who were here in the church today. You are present. You showed up, and David showed up, and God was able to use him. Now, it's not enough for us to just be present. I have to tell you that. It's not enough for us to just show up, but we must also be willing to go and to be engaged. Now, I have to tell you this, young people. I have to tell you this this morning, and I know I have to tell you this based upon experience. When you show up and are willing to go, you may have some people who may try to discourage you from fulfilling the plan that God has for your life. You know, it's sad that we have to tell young people that, but you know, you do have to say this because I've been pastoring churches now for many years. And, and there are times that I wish that we didn't have to say that and think like that. But, you know, sometimes our young people show, will show up and they're present. Now, when they show up, they don't always look the way you think they should look. They may not always do everything the way you think they should do it. And so there are people who, when you show up, sometimes young people, they might discourage you. But I want to tell you today, don't let anybody discourage you when you show up. Unfortunately, there are some people like this, even in many of our churches today, there are some people uh, who, who are even close to you, but they don't mean you well. Now, we saw this in the text. Look at verse 28. Eliab, David's eldest brother, was angry with him. Now, watch this. David showed up. But when he showed up to fulfill his God-ordained destiny, look at his brother, verse 28. Eliab, his eldest brother, was angry with him and even accused him of being present at the battle for the wrong reason. So he's there. And, 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 and his brother now comes and his brother accuses him for being at the battle. We're, who's watching the sheep that we have back home? Why are you here? Well, David is there because that's his God-ordained moment to be there. But you know one of the things I like when I read this story? Watch this. When I read the story, right? Now, David knew that no one knows his heart but God. Sometimes, you know, people say things against you, young people, and, and you know in your heart that it's not true. We can't read one another's. Your motives may be misjudged. Don't get discouraged. Don't let that turn you away. 
Look at what David did. In ver- look, look at what David did. David was not deterred. Neither did he allow his, brothers to, his brother to stand in the way. Look at verse 30. Ver- I love verse 30. Verse 30 says, David simply turned from him towards another. For every distractor, detractor rather, there's always someone else God sent who will help you fulfill your purpose. So you can just see it right now. So now David, David is, is being castigated by his brother. And instead of getting in it to it with his brother, I'm trying to explain. Watch this. Let young people understand this. Understand this. Sometimes when God puts a vision, gives you a vision, or lays something on your heart, you have to be very careful who you share your dreams with. Because some people are dream killers. But if your dream came from God, and if you know that God is leading and guiding and directing you, I want to tell you this morning, stay the course. Do not be deterred. So David is talking to his brother, and his brother is accusing him of being there at, for the wrong reason, not understanding that this is the day of David's destiny. And all David did was turn aside, and he went and talked to somebody else. Because there's somebody who will believe in your dream. There's always somebody else who will encourage you. Now, there are some, now watch this now. I got to talk about this because this is something that I've seen a lot. Now, watch this. You have Eliab who just chewed David out in public. And David turned. He was trying to kill David, you know, trying to discourage David from accomplishing God's purpose for him. Now, now watch this. There are some detractors. There are some people who are more subtle. They are not as upfront as David's eldest brother, Eliab. They try to use reason and to speak to you in soft tones, and they appear to have your best interests at heart. Yet, they too are trying to discourage you from your God-appointed purpose. And watch this. We see this in verse 33. Look at the story. Look at the text in verse 33 with Saul. Saul said to David, you are not able. Now watch this now. David already stood out there and declared that he will go because God was leading him. The Spirit of God put that in David's spirit. Put it in David's heart. David said, I am going. I am not afraid. But listen to Saul. Now listen to Saul. Listen to Saul's words to David. But Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are only a youth and he a man of war. Remember, I think uh, Sister Valeria said what's written on the back of the shirt? Let no man do what? Despise your youth. Let no man despise your youth. Again, David was not to be discouraged, not even by the king. David's mind was made up. He was there to defend God's honor. And nothing, including family or the king, would stand in his way. Praise God, however, that there are not only detractors. Listen to me this morning. And I want some of you older folks to kind of tune in to what I'm saying this morning. Praise God that there are not only detractors. But there are also people who will assist you and help you and guide you to your God-appointed destiny. You know, I can recall such individuals in my church when I was a much younger man or when I was in high school. I can remember some of those old deacons and some of the old elders in the church. They would give me opportunity to do things in the church. And somehow they saw something in me that I had not yet recognized myself. And these older men in the church would say, you need to go to school and you need to study for ministry. Can you believe that some of them recognized the calling God had placed on my life before I even saw and recognized that God had placed that calling on my life? These older, wiser men said, young man, you need to go away to Oakwood and you need to prepare for ministry. So I praise God for these people now that he will also place in your life 
who will prepare you and help you to see your God-appointed destiny. All the members in the church, it is my prayer that each and every one of us, that we will be those types of mentors and we would be those types of voices to the youth. Praise God for those who will not discourage our youth, but encourage them to pursue God's purpose for their lives. According to verse 17 and verse 18, when you read the text, read the story again. These are things that jumped out at me. When you read the story, watch this. It was Jesse, David's age father, who sent him to the battlefront that day. When you read the story, you'll see that in verse 17 and verse 18. So David showed up. He was present. He was in a position to be used by God at the direction of his father. Parents, what are you putting in the spirits of your children? Does God speak through you to help your kids accomplish their dreams? Is God using you as a parent to help direct the feet of your children on the pathway to their God-appointed destiny and purpose? And I suggest to you that if it's not, and I'm going to put myself in, maybe because my daughter's here and she's hearing me preach, <laughs> that, you know, we, we have to pray. We have to pray that when we open our mouths and speak words to our children, that we are helping them to fly and to flourish and to discover God's destiny and his purpose for their lives. I don't know if Jesse understood it that day when he said, David, come, I want you to take these commodities and, and I want you to take it to the battlefront and I want you to go. I don't know if, they, if Jesse knew that that day God was using him to guide his son and direct his son to his God-ordained and appointed destiny on that battlefield that day to honor his God. What comes out of our mouths when we speak? You know, one of the things in youth ministry we recognize is the value of intergenerational relationships. You know, there was a time when we had situations as a pastor. There was a time that I would walk into my church as a pastor, and I would see all the young people here and all the older people there. It's like we had a great divide. What are we going to sing? The young people want to do contemporary. The older folks just want to sing, the, do the hymns. How are we going to set the worship service up? The older folks wanted a more conservative, laid-back service. The young people wanted a service where it was popping and it was live. And we had this big divide in our church, and somehow we allowed some of that to go on. But you know what? In youth ministry, we have now realized that the value and the power is in intergenerational relationships. You know, one of the best examples of intergenerational relationship, you read it when you go home, you read the story of Eli and the young boy Samuel. Samuel needed Eli because Eli had the wisdom and the experience. And Eli needed Samuel. Because Samuel was quick to pop out of bed and go and do whatever needs to be done when Eli's eyes, the Bible says, were growing dim. We need the power of intergenerational relationships in the church. And I'll say this before I get to my last point. Watch this, parents. Watch this, adults in the church. Do you not understand? Listen to this. Because this is so powerful when I think about it. Do you understand that when the young boy Samuel, I'm talking about intergenerational relationships, do you understand that when Samuel answered the call that God had placed upon his life, you go and read it in your Bibles. Do you not notice that Samuel answered his call to God with the words that Eli had placed upon his lips? Eli says, when you hear the voice Call in the game. Samuel doesn't even understand what's going on. He keeps running back and forth to Eli. But Eli being wise and experienced, Eli said, oh, I see what's happening here. He says, young man, the next time you hear the voice calling you, say these words. Speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. That's the power of intergenerational relationship. Young folks and old folks working together. Let me close it down here now. This is the... so. This is the third, this is the last key to success. So I told you, number one, young people, always seek to honor God. 
Number two, be present. Don't stay away from church. Show up at church. When you feel like it, come. When you don't feel like it, come. But don't just come. Get involved and get engaged. And church, make sure that you have things for your young people to do when they do come that they can stay engaged. David wanted to honor God, key number one. David was at a place where God could use him. He showed up on the battlefield. He was present. He was there. And then last of all, this is one, I hope you also understand this. This has proven to be a very important key for me in my life, and I hope it will be for you. Last key, the third key. Have an appreciation for the common place. Have an appreciation for the commonplace. You may say, well, what is the commonplace? I, this is how I define the commonplace. The commonplace is where we live our everyday lives, doing the common things of life. It's our ordinary, everyday experience. That is the commonplace. And you will be surprised at how much God accomplishes in us in the commonplace. Don't despise the commonplace. It is the commonplace where we live day to day. It is the commonplace where God prepares us for the big stages of life. It is the commonplace where God does his miracles. Do not, young people, listen to me, and I hope you get this, hope you understand what I'm saying. Do not despise the commonplace. It was in the commonplace, listen, where David worked every day as a shepherd that God prepared him to face Goliath. Understand? See, there's a reason why, Goliath, why, why David stood boldly and unafraid. David stood boldly and I unafraid for this reason I'm sharing here with you. It, uh, uh, appreciate the commonplace. You may be a student now. Getting ready for your education and preparing for your career. Don't take that lightly. Your classroom right now is the commonplace. What you do in the commonplace, young people, oh man, if I could just open your heads and pour this one in today and make it stick, I would do it. Understand this. What you do in the commonplace now now will help to determine how successful you are in the future. I know there are a lot of people who want immediate gratification. They want to be in the bright lights. They want to be on the big stage right now. Well, you haven't done what you were supposed to do in the commonplace. And if you got on that bright light and those bright lights and that big stage right now, it would all fall apart. You won't have any success and you could not handle it. Do not despise the commonplace. David's success in his battle with Goliath, watch this, was directly linked to how he handled his business in the commonplace. He was fearless when he stood before the boastful, frightening, imposing figure of Goliath because he had learned to be fearless in the commonplace. David didn't learn how to be fearless when he was on that battlefield. He had the assurance. Watch this. David had the assurance of God's presence with him on the battlefield facing Goliath because he knew that God never abandoned him in the commonplace. God had always demonstrated to David his willingness and his ability to protect David, and to give him victories in the commonplace. So David had all of that going on before he even got on the battlefield to to face Goliath. I want to encourage you today, young people. Take, listen, write this down, remember this. Take advantage of every opportunity the commonplace affords you to grow in grace and to get to know God better. And adults, I'm going to say the same thing to you. Because if you understand Seventh-day Adventist theology, you know that there's a day of trying and a day of testing that will come. And if you think that you're going to stand then on that stage 
You are not standing now in the commonplace in everyday life. I want you to know that you will be mistaken. If you're not standing now in the commonplace, you won't stand then when you get to that stage. And you can see that in the, in the life of the Hebrew boys. Don't you think that they just decided to stand when the king said bow down? They had been standing all along in the commonplace. God will use, God will use all of your experiences. Trust him with the little things in life now, and it will prepare you to trust him with the big things later. So I'll just be, I'll just be real with you. Just think about it. If you're not trusting God now with the little things, what makes you think that you're going to trust God with the big things? It was in the commonplace that we become battle-tested. We learn to trust God, to depend on him. I remember the motto when I was in college. The motto was this. It said, what we are to be. This, this was written on the wall when I walked into my college. It says, what we are to be, we are now becoming. When David faced Goliath in battle, he was confident that what God would do for him in verse 37, this is, what, this is what David says. He declared, if God could deliver me, if God could deliver me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, David says, you know what? And this is, was in his commonplace now. This is when he was just out there keeping his sheep. He said, if God can deliver me from that lion and from that bear in the common place. David says, you know what? I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. I, I am very confident that God can deliver me from that giant. Yeah. That was from the common place, brothers and sisters. Don't ever underestimate the work that God will do for you in the commonplace. Some of us, we don't like the commonplace. We got our eyes set on the big stage, the bright lights. Hey, it's what God is doing for you right now that's going to prepare you for that big stage and for those bright lights. So don't underestimate it. It is my prayer today, young people, that as you live life from day to day, that you will encounter God you will experience God, that you will talk to God, and that you will learn to trust God so that when you face your challenges in life, you can be like David. When everybody else in the room is trembling and fearful and about to lose their mind, you're going to step out there boldly, and you're going to say, ah, I will go <laughs> because of what God has done for you and in you. Lord, I pray for your people today. We are so thankful, Lord, that we can read this story and we can see David, a young man, victorious in battle against the great Goliath. But Lord, we know that he was victorious because, number one, he had a deep desire to honor you. He wanted to put you first. May young people today have that deep desire burn. And Lord, and if the desire is not there, may they be honest enough with you to say, Lord, I don't feel that deep burning desire to honor you. Can you place that desire in my heart? Lord, I pray for the young people that they will always show up and that they will always be present and that they will always be engaged. And I pray that they will always be members in this congregation who will not seek to discourage them, but they will allow you to use them to help guide our children and our youth to their God-appointed purpose and destiny. And then, Lord, I pray that for every one of us listening, every one of us in this place today, that we will trust you in the commonplace. We will trust you with the little things in our lives now so that when we face the big things, we can face them with confidence, knowing that since you never abandoned us 
in the commonplace, we know you are not going to abandon us on life's big battlefield. Thank you, Jesus, for hearing our prayer. Amen. Search the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. Put me back together, and every desire is now satisfied.
Father, you've been in our midst in this sanctuary. You've been in our midst in this building from the moment we entered this facility. And we're declaring, Father, this morning the reality that there is nothing. David knew it. Perhaps today we need to rediscover it. And so this morning, I want to speak to your heart. If there's someone here today that would like to say, Lord, do in my life what you did in David's. That when we're facing the challenges in the giants of our life, uh, that we can look at that giant, whatever it may be, a person, a problem, a co-worker, whatever it is, Father, and we can say that we may have that giant, that problem in our life, but greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. That our problems may be small in comparison to the giant God that we serve. So how many of you would like to say, Lord, give us the the boldness to stand against the giants of our world, the giants of our life. If you want to ask God to give you the boldness right now, put your hand up with me. Because I want the strength that was given to David to be given to us right now. You see those hands if that's what you want. Because you're not responding to me. You're responding to the God that we have just sung about. The God what we have just heard about. And the God that is right now speaking to your heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, you see those hands going up because they want the power that was anointed upon David to be upon them right now. They don't want to leave this sanctuary right now, Lord, in the same manner in which they came in. They want holy boldness to face the giants of their life. Make this a reality for them right now, Father. As we begin to, to wrap this up with the words of Solomon, the wisest man who has ever lived, when he said, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Father, we want to submit our lives to you right now as we raise our hands, because we want our paths to be driven by the one who we worship. Help us to follow him down those pathways of our life. And so, Lord, we want to close this time with those words still ringing in our ears. Have it etched in our hearts as we ask it in all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.